and you saw that it was able to collect sectors that none of the other tools were able to do. The worst thing is that most of the other imaging tools, as they were going forward, when they hit the first block here, that it would be done. They would not have continued. You get a little thermometer bar. You don't get any content in hex. You don't even know what you're reading. All they have is a little thermometer bar, goes across, reads content, and when it fails, you don't even know. You don't even have a clue. Most of the time, it'll end, it'll say successful, and you won't even have an image. So, Well, there's a couple of key points. One is, is that it is reading backwards differently than it's reading forwards. And so some of them, like DD Rescue, that can read content in reverse, can actually copy sectors and continue on even after a failure, whereas other imaging tools like Ghost won't be able to do it at all. So you'll be able to go backwards and actually read content. Uh, DD Rescue, the only thing that DD Rescue really can't do is control power to the drive, but it does keep track of the sectors that it's copied, so it would do something very similar to what we've done here. It can skip around on the drive, collect sectors, and put them back together all as one unit and leave, the, leave that in, info alone. Yeah? No, this is actually a piece of hardware called a, 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 a deep spar disk imager. And this tool actually can skip those sectors going forwards. And so it actually tracked those sectors going forwards, continued on, and then came backwards and did them in reverse. Uh, it's the easiest way for me to give you a visual, because most of the other tools don't give you a visual. Uh, DD Rescue will collect data, and it'll basically put numbers together. And you can try to look at the numbers, but it's not very visual from this standpoint. But it'll do the same job. So, uh, and there's a dash R for a, rescue fl uh, for a reverse flag. So you can actually go in reverse. So, so my point is, is that get away from trying to do some of these images or copies using some of those other tools, even some of the ones I listed. These slides are all on my website right now. I posted them this morning before this talk. So if you go to myharddrivedie.com across the bottom here, you'll see uh, on the presentation page, there is a page that has, it, it'll actually say at the top, uh, Freaknik. And you can just click on it, and you'll see all these slides. Because there's a lot of technical information coming up besides just the crap that sucks. So uh, uh, another thing to kind of get out of the way is all these tools, you know, vendor tools and stuff for warranty and stuff, want you to go and try their vendor tools and run them and see whether or not, you know, whatever. Most of the time, they don't even know what the error codes mean themselves. If you actually talk to most of these guys, there's some generic code that comes back, and they don't even have a clue most of the time. They just say, oh, yeah, it's under warranty. Send it in. And you don't get your data or whatever. But most of the time, it doesn't work. And then these other ones, like Microscope and things like that, those tools are for working drives. The drive has to be already functioning for it to do something. It does a butterfly test, tries to read some sectors. Maybe you have one bad block it can't read or something like that. But if the drive isn't functioning, they don't do anything. They, they just basically eat your money. So from that standpoint, you're getting away from those kind of tools. And I probably shouldn't have to tell too many people this from this standpoint. If you're running any of the stuff that's built into your OS to repair stuff, and to if your drive is functioning and you really want that data, it's a terrible idea to run any of these tools until after you've already got a clone or a copy of this drive. You could get a clone of it, and then at least you're fairly safe with regards to being able to go backwards. Once these tools screw up, you can't go backwards in a lot of cases. It just messes you up further, and you can't do anything. And then SpinWrite. Uh, where does SpinWrite write the data that it recovers? Back to the same drive, right? So I, again, I think I've harped on that one in every talk. If maybe he ever made it so it went to another destination disk, because when that drive dies, it's over. And you can only make it worse. So from that standpoint, SpinWrite can just make it worse. So let's skip that. Frozen drives. Everybody asks about, oh, well, why don't I freeze a drive because I hear it works? Well, it does in certain instances. There's a lot of reasons why it might work where maybe uh, contacts contract and they make better connections or a head stuck on a platter and because you've put something in a freezer that it contracts and because metal expands and contracts according to heat, you actually might be able to pop the head off the platter. But look at what it does to the drive. So this is what it will actually look like after the drive is frozen. So if this is your last ditch effort and you don't want to spend any money on it, then great, maybe that's a good choice. But if you're actually trying to be a little more scientific about your problem and solve the problem without doing more detrimental damage to the platter, uh, that might be a good idea. You know what, if this was wobbling a little bit, the head might actually skip across the platter. Yes, sir? You still have a little bit of a condensation problem and a little bit of, uh, I mean, even just with changing the disk and causing that to actually happen, even if there's no condensation, you can still cause other problems like the wobble wobblehead stuff I just mentioned, where you're actually throwing the balance of the platters off. It's very much like a car tire, the way that they're actually balanced with the screws and everything. 
And even, even one screw coming out can actually make a difference on the platters and how they spin, causing a head to skip across the platter doing damage. So I, I'm just not recommending it as your first round. I mean, maybe at the end when you're at, yeah? You can freeze the board. Uh, just make sure, again, that you don't have condensation problems when you actually take the board out and do something with it. And some people even try to heat them up. I don't have nearly as much luck trying to heat up a board, but there are certain instances where a CPU or a processor on the board, uh, there's actually some problems with some chemicals that have been used in some of the processors, and heating them up actually make them work better. So there are some instances. But I have another way of controlling that, uh, using like a pelt air cooler, like ceramic cooling. You can do the same kind of thing and stick it on there, and it will actually work a little bit better. So. Uh, all right, so one of the other, I don't know what's going on with this. Maybe one of these things is interfering. All right, so one other thing I want to talk about real quick is smart data. Because, you know, a lot of people think smart is a, you know, oh, it'll tell me about my drive and it's going to die or something bad's going to happen to it. It's horrible at predicting failure. Uh, basically, smart, it, it will ultimately take numbers and compare numbers together, trying to come up with a result to try to tell you whether your drive is going to fail. And then most of the time, maybe on your bias or something when you're rebooting it, it might give you an answer. Uh, but l let's talk about where smart data comes from and how this is actually going to help you understand your drive a little bit better. All right, so your drive goes through basically a post process, very similar to what your motherboard goes through. It's not just your drive comes on and then there's data coming out of it. It actually goes through this entire initialization phase. And so there's actually a whole bunch of things that it goes through to do self-check, spin up, unmount the heads, make sure everything's reading fine, reads the servo information. Uh, servo is basically feedback from the platter that actually says where the heads are. And then there's this thing called SA reading. Well, there's an area called a system area. And so somewhere on the platters, there's actually a location that stores unique data about this drive. And when I say unique data, I mean things in most cases, especially modern hard drives, almost all of them are storing things like an HPA area, host protected area, or serial numbers and model numbers. So if you happen to get a drive that doesn't mount and things don't work quite right, maybe if you read something from the system area, you can actually determine how far in the process it made just by the content that it gives you back. So let me give you kind of an idea of some of the other stuff in here. So you've got smart data, system logs, your serial number, model numbers, your bad block list. These things are all in this system area. If you get feedback from any of these things, regardless of whether or not you read your user data or not, you know that at least the head read that content. And that will tell you a lot about the state of your drive. So for instance, SMART. So SMART basically, it's terrible at predicting failure, mainly because it's just comparing these parameters. Uh, it basically lacks standards. This is one of the other reasons that SMART, which was uh, self-monitoring uh, self analysis and reporting technology, which was supposed to fix this problem by telling us drives that are failing in advance, Basically, all it does is say, oh, I got a bunch of bad blocks, and as my bad blocks are in increasing, I need to actually do something. Does, does Windows track smart? Does Windows do any kind of smart tests right now? <laughs> no. Currently, none of the previous versions of Windows do any kind of smart tests. Your bias? In most cases, here's the, here's the sad thing. Most of us are concerned about how fast our system boots, and so are manufacturers, and so are the vendors of the drives. So they turn smart off most of the time so they can improve boot time and they can improve the actual response time because SMART actually takes time to do those tests. So in a lot of cases, they're wrong. The other thing that's really, really bad about SMART is regardless of whether or not it's on or in use, the drive does not need SMART to function at all. SMART is completely worthless to the drive. It's only to report to you some parameters back whether or not there's uh, a comparison or not. But for the most part, SMART does nothing for the drive to run, but it can stop the drive from running altogether. So in other words, if the drive had a failure while it's writing to this table, there's not a lot of code to do error correction for the content written to the table. So if the table gets corrupt when the drive is trying to read it back and just trying to read this simple table back, it will cause an exception failure, and the drive will actually fail and go into what's called safe mode. It will not read the rest of the ROM and will not return to a functioning drive just because there was some corruption in this smart table but it's worthless to the drive otherwise. Yeah, so the very first thing data recovery people do usually is clear the smart table. <laughs> this is what this stuff looks like. Most of the time, like I said, uh, when you act, and there's a lot more to it than this, but uh, most of the time you'll end up seeing, well, what are these numbers? What are these thresholds? What are the standards? Well, there aren't any. So basically this ends up being worthless data. But what is good about smart data is